Today I begin the first of three lectures on zooarchaeology, or faunal analysis. What constitutes faunal remains? Bone, that comes to mind immediately, but also teeth, all kinds of shells, whether marine shells, riverine shells, inland land shells, fish scales, egg shells, and potentially even fur, hide, and feathers, although these are rarely preserved. Invertebrates are also a type of faunal remain, but they're usually analyzed by some other specialist. Why analyze faunal remains from archeological sites? Well, the number one reason is to learn about the diet of humans. What meat were they eating? And in the third lecture on zooarchaeology, I'll talk in detail about what we can learn. A zooarchaeologist has two main functions or goals to identify the animal bones, and to interpret the findings. How are animal remains identified? The zooarchaeologist relies on a comparative collection. You must have a comparative collection for the part of the world in which you are working. It's a modern collection of objects used to identify the archaeological specimens. So if you are identifying mollusks, you need a collection of mollusks. Or if you are identifying eggshells, you need a collection of eggshells. These comparative collections can be quite large, as you see in the background here in this picture at the University of Georgia Zooarchaeology Lab. And that's because you wouldn't have just one specimen per species. You want to have a range of specimens. You want to show an adult, a juvenile, an infant. You want to have a male, you want to have a female. Um, so you need kind of a population, as it were, of comparative specimens. Identification relies on comparative anatomy. On the left, the person is holding a fish jawbone, and on the right, the archaeological specimen that looks the same. Secondarily, identification can be aided by museum collections, particularly when the animal is now extinct, such as passenger pigeon, parakeet, or ivory-billed woodpecker. And you may also take a look at reference books, but in the end, you must look at a comparative collection. Here are some examples of reference books. To identify, first you would sort the bones to the animal class. Is the bone a mammal bone, fish bone, reptile or amphibian, or bird bone, and each are distinct enough that you can usually do this kind of a sort. Then you would try to sort to skeletal element. So for example, is it a mammal femur? Is it a fish skull? And when you can, you identify to genus, and if possible, to species. However, most bones that we recover are fragmentary and you may be missing any distinctive portions that would allow you to identify to species or perhaps even to genus. Sometimes you can only say unidentified mammal and indicate a size range. The size range is actually usually a good indication of the type of mammal. Going from class one, mammals weighing less than 100 grams, for example, meadow mouse, all the way up to class six, mammals cow size and larger. For your part of the world, you are likely to have a limited number of mammals that would fall in any one of these classes. And so being able to identify the size class actually might give you a pretty good indication of the sort of mammal you might have. To identify the genus or species, you need to be able to write scientific nomenclature. It has very simple rules, and I expect my students to learn these. Note that genus is always capitalized, and species is never capitalized, and when you type them, they are both always italicized. It can't get any more simple than that. If you are handwriting, you underline each word separately to indicate italics. Genus may be abbreviated if it's understood in the context of the sentence. For example, I might say, more than one species of Homo has been recognized, and these include, but are not limited to, Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. So although I spoke the, the genus Homo each time, 
In writing, I could abbreviate it because it was understood what capital H italicized stood for. The second major task of zooarchaeology is to interpret the bones. What bones you have to interpret depend on a number of factors. The characteristics of the bones, taphonomic factors including deposition, and the recovery steps that you've taken. Survival of bone is correlated with bone density. The more dense the bone is, the more likely it is to be preserved. So for example, very dense heavy bison bones, such as you see here on the left, are much more likely to be preserved than our thin skull bones, such as this paper thin bones that you see in the ostrich skull. Before you can interpret the animal bones, you also must understand and account for various biases that are introduced by taphonomic factors, which themselves can be either natural and or cultural in origin. Taphonomy is the study of the processes that affect bone after the death of the organism. This illustration talks about going from the life assemblage to the death assemblage to what gets deposited. Post-depositional, what are the biotic and abiotic factors that affect those bones? And then you end up with an archaeological assemblage and what do you recover out of that assemblage? All of these will affect what ends up under your microscope that you have to interpret. Again, taking you through some of these processes with some kind of fancy names here. Living moose. Here it is, attacked and killed. Humans cut away some meat and take it away. And from here on down, it's talking about post-depositional processes that might affect that bone. It's perhaps much simpler to think about this in terms of depositional factors and post-depositional preservation or destruction. Thinking about deposition, the first issue is, was the bone transported to the site? Archaeologists are pretty good at finding large sites, villages and towns. We're not so good at finding uh, a single location where perhaps, say, one rabbit was killed. The likelihood of partial or total butchering increases with distance from habitation and size of the animal. So if you travel five miles and kill a mastodon, it's nearly impossible that you're going to carry that whole mastodon back to, back to the village. Whereas if you killed a rabbit, you might bring the entire rabbit back with you. In addition, parts with low productivity may not be transported. So even when you could potentially pick up the entire animal, say like a deer, you might not. You might only bring back those parts that you're going to use and leave behind those parts that you're not going to use. Where and how was the bone deposited? Buried bone preserves much better than bone exposed like this to weathering or to cooking. There are a number of cultural taphonomic processes, including burning the bone, which results if you've got bone still in the meat and you're cooking the meat, or boiling, or butchering and processing. Think about the major states in which a bone could be discarded. It could be fresh. It could even be putrescent. Both of these are still organic with little physical change. Or the bone could have been roasted. In that case, it's lost some organic matter and it's increased in brittleness. A lightly boiled bone also has lost organic matter. Heavily boiled bone is the least likely to be preserved. Boiling, heavy boiling destroys most organic matter and the bone becomes porous and crumbly. Heavily burned or calcined bone also has had a lot of organic matter destroyed, but then the bone becomes inert and is relatively well preserved. You can think about burning in four stages, unburnt, burnt, where you see black or brown patches on a bone, carbonized, where the collagen has been burnt, Calcine, white and chalky, caused by oxidation of the black carbon. Archaeologists, of course, do experimental archaeology. 
testing the results of burning at different stages, going from the left, unburnt, all the way to heavily calcined on the right. Other cultural effects on bones include categories of skinning and butchery, blows, chopper hack marks, cut marks, scrape marks, saw marks. We expect that most of the animal bone that we find at archaeological sites is there because humans brought back meat with bone in it. So it is cultural in origin. How can you tell when it's not cultural, when it's commensal? Well, you'd expect maybe a high number of elements per individual and the skeleton may be articulated, that is, the bones still in anatomical order. For example, if you brought back a deer, haunch, and you ate it, you're not going to find the entire deer. However, if after you've left, maybe you've gone off hunting for the season, and a mouse comes in, roots around in your pit, and dies, I would expect to find all of the elements, the entire mouse skeleton. Well, maybe not, because it's small bones, not very dense. How well do they preserve? But the bones that I do find might even be articulated. Now, one exception to this are deliberate burials, which of course are cultural. You'd expect these to be mostly articulated and you'd hopefully also be able to see the pit into which they were placed, such as these dog burials. Natural taphonomic processes also affect preservation after, de after deposition. One is weathering, especially if the bone was left on the surface. And in this illustration from left, an unweathered bone to right, a badly weathered bone. Other biotic processes affect bone, particularly soil pH, but also temperature, moisture, the oxygen level, and the bacteria. Commensal and scavenging animals chew on bones. Canids destroy the end of long bones and totally remove small bird and fish bones. Other destructive examples would include trampling, fracturing bone deliberately to get out the marrow or process it for grease, butchering, disarticulation, cooking meat with bone on it, again carnivores or scavengers gnawing on bone, or using the bone for tools. The third factor that affects what animal bones you will see under the microscope is what recovery steps have you taken. Unfortunately, about 94% of the faunal reports depend on bone that was recovered by one quarter inch mesh dry screening, which over represents large and sturdy bones. It's much better to use one eighth inch mesh or smaller. Water screening or flotation both recover a more representative sample of range of bone sizes, particularly flotation. Without flotation, fish will probably be underrepresented. To summarize, faunal analysts or zooarchaeologists identify and interpret animal bones from sites. They rely on a comparative collection for identification. What bones are available for interpretation depend on the characteristics of the bones, taphonomic factors, and the recovery steps that the archaeologist has taken. Taphonomic factors may be cultural and or they may be natural. Simply one quarter inch dry screening is not adequate for recovery of all faunal remains. You really need to do flotation. If you'd like to learn more, please also watch Faunal Analysis Part 2, which talks about primary and secondary data collection and Faunal Analysis Part 3, Interpretation. What can you learn from Faunal Analysis?